All right, so, um, so today's lecture is about uh, the quantization of gauge theories, specifically about um, the fadev popov procedure for uh, non-abelian gauge theories. Um, so as I told you, the, the chapters with uh, an asterisk will be uh, skipped since those are extra. Um, so, uh, to, uh, before we do the quantization, we should uh, review the classical uh, uh, gauge theory. So, um, the starting point is uh, young mills gauge field, which is a field uh, that belongs to uh, that um, takes values in a, in a Lie algebra of a group G, meaning that I have a mu a times the generator is TA. Um, and um, uh, in, the, in the Lie algebra, that means to say that the um, um, a representation of the field is uh, the adjoint representation. Um, a general group element for uh, the uh, uh, for the group would be uh, exponent of the generator TA times some parameters alpha. A. Um, <clears throat> And uh, note that uh, I use here the anti-Hermitian anti generator uh, convention. That means TA dagger is minus TA. That means that also the Lie algebra is TA commuted with TB is FABC TC without an I. And um, in general, the normalization relation is uh, for the generator is called uh, trace TATB uh, equal delta AB times uh, a constant uh, TR. Um, the convention that I use is that TR is minus a half for the fundamental representation. Um, now, another popular convention in the literature is with um, Hermitian generators and TR equal to one in the adjoint. That is to say, I have TA commuted with TB, I, F, A, B, C, T, C, and um, trace TA, T, TB is equal to delta AB, but in the adjoint. That's another popular uh, convention, especially for young mills. But uh, the one I use is this one, um mostly because it's the it's one that is more used in supersymmetry um i mean it depends it, various people use various conventions but this is one i'm mostly be using now another uh, relevant uh, constant is um the casimir the quadratic Casimir of the representation. That means the sum of uh, the elements of the Lie algebra of TR in the corresponding representation. So TR is a matrix, and in the corresponding representation, TI, uh, TI, um, TAR squared is equal to the identity times CR. So C Casimir means that sum over a of ta to some power is proportional to the identity and quadratic is because it's the second power now um, with these definitions there's a relation between um, these various constants that is to say uh, tr the um, constant that is defined in the um, in the um, um, no convention for normalization. So TR times the number of generators, Ng, 
is this uh, quadratic uh, Casimir CR times um, uh, times NR, which means uh, the number um, uh, sorry the number of uh, uh, the, the the dimension of the representation so to speak so matrices are NR by NR. Um, <clears throat> all right, in the adjoint representation, by definition, the, um, the, the generators TA, I think this is BC, are equal to FABC, these structure constants. That's the definition of the adjoint representation. In that case, it means that um, uh, TR, um, uh, TR, which means the um, the connection, the uh, the trace of TATB is equal to uh, CR with the quadratic uh, Casimir, and we also have, by definition, since we are in the um, we are in the joint representation, that the number Ng, which is number of generators, is equal to the number, the dimension of the representation. Now, uh, for the um, uh, for the um, SUN case, for the case of uh, the group SUN, which is of most interest for Young Mills theories, we will have a uh, number of generators n squared minus one course, since SUN means n by n matrices, and S means that the determinant is one, so you have one uh, constraint, so it's n squared minus one. While uh, in this case, the fundamental representation is n, so the fundamental representation are really n by n matrices. Now, uh, my normalization is uh, TR is equal to minus one in the fundamental, and that in general leads to CR equal to N squared, um, that leads to uh, CR being N squared minus one divided by two N. If you replace in this condition, Right, you get um, so ng is n squared minus one, tr is minus one, one half, and nr is n. So this is what you get. Um, <clears throat> uh, so how do we introduce gauge fields? Well, we start with um, some field in some fundamental in some uh, representation of uh, the global symmetry group G. So let's say some field psi with some index i goes into uij psi j, where uij is a matrix in some representation of the group. And uh, then we made the we want to make the invariance the global uh, symmetry we want to make it local that is we want to have invariance under ui of x instead of ui j um, uh, just just a number so uh, in order to do that we have to introduce the ga gauge field a mu a with a minimal coupling of the matter to it. That is to say, <clears throat> we replace the um, normal derivative on the field, which appears in the kinetic um, term for the field, with the covariant derivative written as the normal derivative plus uh, this gauge field, but then, and then uh, times a coupling. And also in order to match indices, I have to multiply uh, a a mu by the um, uh, 
a LIA a algebra generator, TA. In this ge generator, uh, in this uh, representation, um, R, that is with indices IJ. In particular, in the adjoint representation, that means D uh, mu with indices AB will be D mu del mu uh, delta AB plus J and the TAs are FABC. So J, G, FABC, A mu, C. All right. Now, um, for an in infinitesimal gauge transformation with um, um, par parameter uh, alpha A, <clears throat> we will have that U is approximately one plus alpha A, T A, and I can put a factor of the coupling G in front. And in this case, uh, the gauge field transforms according to the transformation rule a mu or delta a mu is equal to covariant derivative in the represent in the um, adjoint representation a b times uh, covariant derivative of the parameter alpha so with index b if the um, transformation is um, finite that is to say if uh, um, if alpha a is not infinitesimal, then a mu goes to uh, a mu depending on in the parameter on the matrix u, which is u minus one a mu u plus one over g d mu u u minus one, and we define the uh, field strength of the gauge field a mu by f f, f mu um, uh, f mu a being uh, d mu a mu a minus d mu a mu a plus g, g f a b c a mu b a mu c. So uh, you see now this uh, field strength, unlike the, ma um, the Maxwell case, now has also um, two uh, gauge fields. And we can contract with the Lie algebra generator and define f mu nu as being f mu nu a times t a, in which case f mu nu is d mu a nu minus d nu a mu plus g times the commutator of a mu with a nu, because f a b c comes from the commutator of t a with you know, t t b with uh, t c. Uh, to write this even in a more uh, compact way, we can um, we can write a form notation. Uh, forms are um, anti-symmetric uh, objects that are infinitesimal. So specifically, the one form for uh, that we're interested in is dx mu. And um, uh, and uh, the uh, usefulness of uh, forms is that you can uh, make products of them that are anti-symmetric. So here it is a typo. It should have been wedge. So there's a wedge product in between uh, dx mu and dx nu. And there's also a, a con um, normalization constant, one over, ha one over two. So I can define f as one over two, f mu nu dx mu wedge dx nu. And in general, the, the uh, product of uh, P, the wedge product of P um, uh, one forms is defined this way, dx mu one up till dx mu P and with uh, one over P factorial in front. With this def uh, definition, I write just F is dA plus J G A wedge A. 
Now, the field strength in Maxwell theory is something that's invariant uh, and therefore uh, observable. Uh, in the um, young Mills case, that is not the case. The field strength uh, transforms, just that transforms so-called covariant, covariantly, meaning with u minus 1 to the left and with u to the right. You see that if u is a billion, if it's a number, then it cancels. That's the case of Maxwell. But uh, in the case of Yangmills, it doesn't, it transforms. So to make something invariant in order to make, um, uh, in order to make a, um, um, uh, to make an action, you have to put a trace of f minu f minu, right? So the action can be written as, for instance, one with my convention of uh, normalization, one half plus one half integral of trace f minu squared, and then by doing the trace of the implicit t a s t b is in in here actually minus one quarter f mu nu a f mu nu a now in order to um, in order to uh, go to Euclidean space we vic rotate as usual x4 to uh, i t and therefore del 4 to minus i del t However, the same is true for um, fields. So um, x4 is uh, a contravariant, uh, uh, contravariant vector, and the uh, d mu is a covariant vector. So the same for contravariant and covariant uh, uh, fields. So a4 with 4 down, transform my d4 so it's minus a minus i a, a zero and uh, that means that um, the euclidean uh, uh, electric field ea um, ei euclidean is del 4 ai minus del i a4 and it's therefore minus i times the electric field in minkowski so that means that the Euclidean Lagrangian is plus one quarter f minu a f minu a. I just changed the sign in front of the Minkowski uh, action, or minus one half trace f minu squared. And in components, it, sorry, in uh, in terms of uh, electric and magnetic field, it's plus one half e a squared plus b a squared. All right. Now let's go over to the uh, the Popov procedure. As you know, I have to define correlation functions. Sorry, just a moment. I have to define uh, correlation functions um, to in order to obtain uh, observables um, to obtain observables from them. I mean, they are not observable themselves. Um, note also that uh, in a gauge theory, the observables have also to be gauge invariant. Um, by definition, um, let's do it in Euclidean space, which is, as you know, it's easier to define for correlation functions. And uh, correlation functions are defined as path integrals of the um, product of operators, and uh, with then path integrated over the field of the Gamil field with um, with the weight e minus the action. 
But then you also have to divide by the um, uh, path integral with e minus the action. If you remember from uh, quantum field theory one, that means that we have to fix to sort of fix the gauge by the for the pop of procedure, which amounts to dividing um, to um, uh, dividing an numerator and uh, denominator with sort of the volume of the gauge group. That is to say, the uh, product of uh, all the points of the um, of the um, uh, elements of the ga gauge group. So integral du, path integral of a du will uh, cancel out. Um, now, how do we uh, integrate over these um, gauge transformations? Well, in in the case of uh, Young Mills, the uh, correct uh, integration measure is one that I mean, is defined uh, sort of uh, formally as du. But uh, what it means is that it has to be um, uh, invariant both from the left and from the right by multiplication with a fixed element. Um, all right. So um, we have to fix a gauge by this father prop of procedure and um, the um, the gauge that we want to fix will have um, an index a in um, in the um, the algebra that is to say a is going to move from one uh, to n um, and it will be of the type uh, f a of x equal to zero uh, which is a generalization of the Lorentz gauge d mu a mu a equal to zero. And then we further generalize that to f a of x is equal to some c a of x, some uh, function. Um, in order to proceed, we define uh, two ob uh, objects. First, we define the orbit of the gauge field as the space of all possible gauge transformation of um, of, a uh, of a given a mu of x. That is to say, the orbit of a mu is all a mu tilde that um, are um, a mu uh, tra gauge transformed by uh, u of x. And then uh, we also define the, uh, the space of all possible uh, gauge fields satisfying a gauge condition. That is to say, um, the gauge, the, the, all the a mu satisfying uh, f mu a, f mu um, a of a of a mu is equal to the same uh, C A of X. Um, and let's uh, postulate that uh, there is a single um, intersection point between the orbit and uh, M. So uh, pictorially we say we have uh, M, which is uh, Sorry, we have uh, the first the orbit, which you start from some gauge field, and then we get gauge transform uh, all of them, and then the um, there's M, which is the um, the space of all uh, gauge fee gauge fixed fields, and we assume there's a single intersection point, that is to say, from a mu, or from some a mu a, we go to a, a gauge fixed, to a unique gauge um, gauge fixed uh, point. Now, this is um, actually true. This is actually uh, tr true only for infinitesimal gauge transformations. Otherwise, 
as found by so for, for, for large gauge transformations as found by, by Gribov, they are so-called Gribov copies. Um, so uh, so the, cop the Gribov copies uh, uh, happen at a very large distance in gauge transformation space from the identity. So if you're interested in um, uh, total path integral over uh, all fields, uh, infinitesimal and otherwise, so for if you're interested, therefore, in non-perturbative uh, um, effects, then you have to consider also the degree of our copies. And that's uh, a difficult uh, issues, which I will not uh, talk about. But let's assume uh, for a moment that there's no group of copies, and we're just looking at this uh, unique point, um, which is uh, the gauge fixed uh, version of the gauge for fix, uh, the gauge field A. Well, then let's define one of a delta of F, C, and A. So by definition, this is uh, the uh, path integral of a uh, uh, du. So du x uh, product of all x. And then product also of, of all uh, y's. Uh, so this is a mu uh, a rho of y, c a of y. And A's of um, of the gauge uh, um, gauge fixing condition acting on A transformed by U. Okay. So by your by our uh, assumption, there's a unique um, there's a unique uh, U, which I will def define by U with uh, an upper index A. Um, there's a unique transform, um, transformation that takes uh, the gauge field A into the gauge transformation, which therefore means, uh, takes this uh, delta to 0. Um, so we, we can say, therefore, that there's a unique um, uh, U defined by UA, and in this case, I write FA of the gauge field A transformed by U depending on A, and this is e equal to CA. Then <clears throat> we um, we define the matrix MAB. So the matrix both in indices, in Lie, uh, Lie algebra and indices, so with indices A, B, and also with, um, well, quote unquote indices, but um, continuous variables uh, X, so X, Y, depending on X, Y, um, which is um, which is the following, it's, it's um, the covariant derivative of delta of x minus y, and then multiply with the um, uh, derivative of the gauge condition with respect to the gauge field. So as usual, this is the um, covariant derivative in the, uh, Lie, um, in the adjoint representation, so d mu a b with uh, with G uh, with uh, the structure constants here G, uh, F A B C and in this case we have uh, two properties. The first property is that this uh, delta that we've defined here is gauge invariant, and the second property is that um, delta is equal to determinant of this m, but with uh, 
with the instead of a with a j transformed by u a u of a. So to prove the first uh, uh, the first assumption, well, that's kind of uh, trivial in a sense. I um, transform a by a, a fixed u zero into a with uh, transform by u zero, and then. Uh, in here, I have A transformed by U0, but then also transformed by U. But um, uh, but then, of course, that means A is transformed by U, U0. Um, what's, yeah, the only non-trivial thing is that this delta also included the path integral uh, over U. So du, and now I multiply u with u the fixed u zero from the right, so it has to be the harm measure that has this property that uh, it's uh, invariant to multiplication by a fixed u zero from the right. All right, and then uh, let me define as u tilde this u time u zero, and then. Uh, then I have uh, the same transformation, uh, the same uh, function in here in terms of u tilde. Uh, so you see that delta minus one of a transformed by zero is equal to delta minus one of a. All right, so the pro property one is kind of uh, um, very simple. Proper property two, uh, is a bit more complicated. Um, first, we write, well, we use property one to um, define del delta of A as delta of A transformed by U of A. And this object I will call A tilde. Um, <clears throat> And since I have a delta of um, so, um, so I have determinant I have determinant of this object. So this object I will call, as I said, uh, a tilde. But by definition u of a means I transform a with u of a, I go into the um, uh, gauge, uh, gauge fixing con condition. So f of a tilde is by definition ca. <clears throat> that means that uh, delta of a is equal by the property one with, del uh, with delta minus one of uh, a tilde. Um, which is integral of um, um, of uh, uh, delta with a, a gauge condition on uh, a tilde transformed by u, right? So this is the definition of uh, delta minus one of something is path integral delta f f of a transformed by u. <clears throat> and let's consider infinitesimal transformation. Remember, that's really the point that we have to consider um, infinitesimal transformation, not uh, very large. Um, so then uh, du is uh, equal to uh, d al uh, alpha a. Um, uh, sorry, uh, the alpha ATA. Uh, TA is missing here. Um,
Uh, no. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, it's not missing. Um, what have I said? No. Um, yeah. No, it is missing, and then it's some, of course. Um, yeah, um, and then uh, this is also some, I guess, <clears throat> uh, which leads to um, uh, a tilde transformed by u being a tilde plus the covariant uh, uh, derivative acting on alpha. Right, that's the um, infinitesimal uh, transformation of uh, a Lie algebra uh, field. Now, um, then um, f tilde of uh, f of uh, a tilde transformed by u is f of a tilde. Now u is infinitesimal, so I have to um, consider. Um, uh, the sort of derivative. Um, so I first take the derivative with respect of the gauge transformation with respect to a tilde, and then I transform a tilde in this way. So uh, I multiply by uh, the covariant derivative of the parameter, and then I substitute in. Uh, I substitute this in delta, delta minus one of uh, a tilde. Um, and I obtain that um, delta minus one uh, of a, which is delta minus one of a tilde. It's also now uh, the uh, the the power measure the measure of a du is uh, uh, also measure of uh, is also um, the al alpha a but then if I have product of a of a dx I also have product over a implicitly so this is um, product over x and a of the alpha x and a. Um, and uh, delta function is of a tilde transformed by u, but um, uh, so uh, sorry, of uh, f of a tilde transformed by u, but this is f of a, a tilde plus this thing. But f of a tilde by definition is equal to c a. So what is, we're left with is this thing, delta of this thing. Um, um, and this is by definition, by our definition of the matrix M, this is just the matrix M integrated over, uh, over Z with some alpha of Z. So the, our M was this thing acting on delta of Y minus Z. Um, and then by definition, uh, sorry, not by definition, but so, so if, if I have this M um, in here, um, I have, usually I have uh, this um, property that the uh, integral product of integrals over delta uh, alpha i of uh, delta function of m times uh, an alpha i gives one over determinant of m. And now the only difference is that I have instead of i, I have an index a and an index, continuous index uh, y, which is the coordinate. 
So I still get one of a determinant of the, in the, of the matrix. And um, this was what we're calculating was one of a delta. So therefore, delta is equal to determinant m, as we said. That was uh, property two. All right. So with these uh, two properties, now we can um, do the Fadev Popov procedure. So the first thing we do is we take the determinant from this side to this side. OK? So now I have one on this side remains just one is equal to <coughs> integral over du so remember this is integral d alpha but that was also equal to integral du um, of uh, determinant m times this delta function um, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, no, I, I meant delta itself. So delta, it's, uh, delta itself, uh, the definition of delta was uh, du uh, delta f of a transformed by u minus ca. So now I have inserted here determinant m. So I have delta um, path integral over u determinant m, and then uh, product of delta of f of a transformed by u. So this is the result. However, <clears throat> the delta this delta function inform uh, enforces anyway that u is equal to u a, right? So delta function means that uh, this is equal to 0. But then, uh, by definition, this is the de definition of u, a, u of a. f of a transformed by u of a is equal to ca. So um, we can, um, we can uh, replace this. Uh, equation in here. So I can write uh, inside the determinant, uh, instead of u of a, I just write u. I, this hasn't changed anything. Um, <clears throat> so we get to this equation. Now, let me introduce, well, this is a silly notation, one depending of alpha. One is one doesn't depend on anything. But what it, this means is that this is a com combination of pi's and alphas, which are constants. So um, it's not a variable. So this one of alpha uh, is a path integral of a C A of uh, e minus one over two alpha integral of C A squared. Right. This is a Gaussian. This is a Gaussian path integral. And you know, it's some uh, it's some constant. You know, uh, in the Gaussian you have square root uh, pi over um, square root pi over alpha, but then this is uh, path integral, so uh, you have uh, also a number of pi's, a number of alphas. Um, but doesn't matter. This is some normalization constant. It's and it's irrelevant in in correlators since uh, we'll get the same uh, normalization constant uh, in the denominator and the numerator, and it will uh, cancel. Um, <clears throat> um, so, but the reason I call this one of alpha one of alpha is that I just substitute this. I put this inside here. So uh, assuming this is like 1, I just insert this integral in here. Um, but then you see uh, delta function 
um, put C equal to F of A. So I just substitute uh, C A with F of A transform by U inside. So I get that this one of alpha, is e this constant, is equal to path integral determined M. And then in here, I've, I've done the, the integral over uh, uh, of, um, uh, I, I've done the determinant, uh, the delta function, sorry. I have uh, used it. So here I have e to minus 1 over 2 alpha f a squared. And now I insert this inside uh, the path integral. And uh, I get, um, I get in the, um, uh, in the uh, um, path integral for without anything, so in the path integral over e minus uh, the action, I get uh, path integral uh, of uh, over a, then path integral over um, over gauge transformations d du determinant m of a of u of a transformed by u, and then e minus the action minus this thing f, f squared over 2 alpha. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I can uh, change the order of this uh, thing uh, of a and u of u path integral over a and u. <clears throat> and then um, in here, um, because of uh, the gauge invariance of uh, um, of um, the gauge invariance uh, of the measure and uh, of the action, so the gauge invariance um, over this uh, measure and uh, this action. I can replace everywhere A by A transformed by U. So, um, so well, here I had A transformed by U, but here I can put also A transformed by U, and here I also put A transformed by U. And then I just replace, I have everywhere A transformed by U, which I can just recall, uh, redefine by as A or A tilde if you want, but I call it A. So finally then, I, I have ob obtained that the path integral is this uh, integral path integral over A with determinant M of A, and then with this extra term minus F squared over two alpha. And finally, I have, um, um, I have factorized the um, the gauge transformations, the path integral over u, and of course I do the I can do the same procedure for the path integral with um, operators inserted. So uh, um, so I get um, yeah so I get the same uh, thing. So the action is now the action minus one half. 1 over 2 alpha f squared, and I have this det determined m. And uh, the path integral over gauge transformation is, uh, is factorized. So in the, uh, in the ratio of the two, it just cancels. So in the correlator, uh, the volume of, um, sorry, the, the, yeah, the path integral over gauge uh, over gauge uh, um, uh, gauge transformations, you uh, just uh, cancels, and I get this effective action, which is the action plus integral over f squared over two alpha, and then I also have uh, rewritten this determinant, so the determinant. 
of a matrix can be written as uh, e to the minus log, right? Uh, so, sorry, e to the log of the same thing. Um, and here I have minus the action, so it's minus determinant uh, minus log determinant m. All right. Um, so this term is what we call the fi gauge fixing term. We're familiar with it already from uh, quantum field T01 in the case of um, Maxwell. But this thing is new. This, um, this thing I will uh, transform into what we will call a ghost action, this log determinant m. So first, so yeah, let's uh, first consider the Lorentz gauge, which is the most relevant one, where fa is just b mu a, a mu a. And then the matrix M becomes what? Well, normal derivative del mu, covariant derivative d mu of the delta function of x minus y. So I have this del mu squared term, and then this term with, um, with uh, del mu uh, a mu c. Um, and of course, we're interested in log determinant m, but um, I can divide by determinant m by determinant sum of del squared, which is uh, a constant might be an infinite constant, but it doesn't matter, it's a constant, which cancels between, um, between the uh, denominator and nom uh, numerator in the correlator. Um, so, so yeah, I isolate this thing and I drop it. And I'm only interested in this. Uh, professor. Yes, yeah. uh, yes. That, that expression for M 12.53 shouldn't be, uh, th th there was a, a, a derivative of f and f is the mu a mu shouldn't be one more derivative uh, no so so if you go back for the definition of m yeah so the definition of m was uh the, the, the derivative of f times something yeah derivative sorry so yeah. derivative of f with respect to the gauge field, right? Yeah. Well, f a now is d mu, uh, del mu a mu, right? Yeah. The derivative of del mu a mu with respect to a mu is del mu, right? I so that's what I have. So so this this is now del mu, the, the normal uh, derivative, acting yeah. on the rest, right? So it's the functional derivative, but like, no. Well. Because yeah. the, the, the derivative is, is acting I mean, on f, it's not acting on d, right? Yeah, I mean, OK, it's a, it's, uh, yeah, maybe, yeah, you can think of it Should as be. a functional derivative if you want. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, but. Uh, but it should be inside an integral. I don't understand this. Well, uh, yeah, how I would put it. Yeah, if I would put it, um, uh, let's say um, I rewrite it as um, del mu uh, a mu of y, the integrated over x, and then with delta of x minus y, right? And then I do a functional derivative with respect to um, uh, a mu, and uh, and then I get uh, um, um, yeah. Okay. I, I, yeah. I must. I must say, I, 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 I don't know exactly how to define this formally, uh, how to define this uh, rigorously, but um, 
but yeah, it's it's just you just uh, yeah, just make make a derivative with respect to to it and to a mu, and uh, it amounts to just you know uh, erasing uh, a mu if you want. So uh, if I have, I, I'll I'll give you another. So, so normally, you would have something like this, right? Uh, and then you would say uh, derivative with respect to a mu uh, a is just this f mu a b. But now, if you if you want, you can think of the indices a b uh, also as indices. Um, in uh, continuous indices x and y right so then as i was saying uh, there was you can rewrite this as a um, as a um, integral over some y and then del mu a mu um, also acting on um, um, on delta of x minus y and uh, yeah, the, 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 the point is anyway. You 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 think of of them. You think of x as part of this uh, matrix indices, right? So uh, when you take uh, a derivative with respect to a mu of x. You, you think of x as just another index, right? That's summed over. That's all, right? I mean, I think of this as a, f mu uh, f mu a a mu a, right? And uh, and I take a derivative with respect to a mu a, and I get this a mu a, a, a phi, phi mu a, right? And a just happens to be both linear algebra and x, right? That's what it means. Now, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I cannot. Uh, I cannot think now how I would write this rigorously, but that's how you think about it. I mean, before I also said that I think of uh, x as just another index. Okay. All right. So, um, so, so, so. Um, yeah, so as I said here, I, I, I think of uh, uh, the matrix in both indices A and uh, X. Um, <clears throat> because also we have determinant and determinant M is supposed to be also I mean, that also is kind of not very well defined. <laughs> Mathematically, I am not sure how to define it rig rigorously determinant when I have the x also. I mean, I suppose you could, uh, you could uh, uh, sort of make it uh, um, uh, yeah. Instead of being continuous to be discrete, but um, yeah, yeah, maybe that's that's a way to think about it. But then derivative, how to make it rigorous? Uh, well, okay, I, I don't know, but. Uh, this is all. This is all uh, sort of formal uh, manipulation. So, 
Um, anyway, so then, uh, then I have the determinant of m divided by del squared. And uh, I'll, I can call this 1 plus n since, anyway, the first term in m is del squared. And then this thing would be n. And, uh, and so uh, 1 plus n would be equal to this thing. There would be this delta and then this uh, integral um, uh, this integral over um, over z. Um, yeah, sorry, here is not uh, capital delta, is uh, little delta x minus z, uh, derivative with respect to z, f a mu c. Um, also of z, delta of z minus y. So this, when integral of x over z, gives a mu of uh, x, delta of x minus y. Um, but then a determinant is always, a determinant can be written as exponent of trace log. So determinant of the matrix 1 plus n is e to the trace log of 1 plus n. But log is written as sum of a minus 1 to the n plus 1 to n plus 1 over n, uh, the matrix to the power n. So <clears throat> then I have a uh, exponent of and then I write this trace. So and then trace now is thought of both in index A and in uh, index uh, continuous index X. So I can write this as um, the first power N traced over, traced over A. So if F, F A A C C, right? And um, yeah, here everything should be a little dumped, I think. And so on. Um, <clears throat> and uh, also, a, a trace means an integral. So now I also have an integral uh, over Well, I'm, miss, I'm missing. Yeah, I wrote this all wrong. Um, you see, it's x here and x here, so it has to be um, traced. That means it must be integrated. Ah, sorry. But here is integral dx. And so on. Um, so, but this would be a very complicated form. So, this is a form that you could use. It's in the exponent now, and you know, um, I could just add that to the action. But it's very complicated term. It's it's uh, 
you know, highly non-local. There's all sorts of integrals over, uh, over coordinates. Um, so that's not very useful form. So this form, although it's um, sort of the most obvious thing to do, when you have a matrix and you want the de determinant to be written inside an exponent, I mean, that's how you would do it. Um, it's not um, it's not very good. But the point is, uh, this form was useful for uh, bosons, for writing it in terms of bosons. But there is a, another uh, another way to exponent and exponentiate a determinant by writing it as a path integral. So we remember that a path integral over some field phi and some field phi bar, the complex, the independent complex conjugate of exponent minus phi bar m phi is some normalization constant times determinant of m to the power plus or minus one depending on whether this is anti-commuting or commuting. So if it's commuting, is one of a determinant. But if it's anti-commuting, it's determinant. So this is what we have. We have determinant. So we write it with anti-commuting variables. So let's write these variables as eta i and eta i bar. Moreover, there's a possible term in front of the uh, action. So if I write plus or minus here, I get just plus or minus 1 to the power n, since well, these are uh, discretized um, fields. So at, at some point, uh, i, that stands for position x. Um, so. Uh, Um, so, um, um, so let's choose the sign with plus. So normally I would choose the, the sign with minus because I want to write, uh, well, I mean, I want to write an action or something, uh, write action for the field phi. But let's write now with uh, plus. And let's also consider Lorentz uh, gauge. In this case, what I would get now, so uh, for the determinant m was written as a path integral over m with eta bar and on one side and eta on the other. Now in Euclidean space, we get um, uh, we get a minus sign here. That that was just a convention, as I said. Um, and we have eta bar times this is um, this is the matrix M for uh, the Lorentz gauge. As I said, the Lorentz gauge. I have the der derivative of f with respect to a, which is just del mu. So del mu acting on the covariant derivative d mu and further. All right. Now, um, also, so that's one notation. But this notation is um, somewhat misleading, as we know from the complex uh, integration of anti-commuting objects. The uh, integrations are truly um, are truly independent. Um, that's why one usually uh, writes uh, b for eta, ba eta bar and c for eta. Um, that is to say, um, one writes usually minus the, this term as minus b del mu d mu uh, c. Um, for a general condition, of course, 
instead of del mu, I have as usual uh, derivative of the gauge condition with respect to A. And um, if I have some other, uh, some other um, um, gauge condition that generalizes the Lorentz gauge, that like some other matrix um, multiplying A mu, then of course I get um, um, I get um, in here I will get uh, this uh, phi mu phi mu AB. Um, so one example of some other gauge that is of this type is the so-called axial gauge, which is um, a constant vector times uh, delta AB. Now, this is uh, not so, I mean, you might say it's not so useful since it's not Lorentz covariant. But, I mean, that's how we do, also, do it also in uh, um, in electromagnetism, we consider, for instance, the um, uh, the Coulomb gauge. So that's sort of generalization of the idea of the Coulomb gauge. Um, all right. So I think uh, that's what I wanted to tell you today. Uh, yeah. So. Do you have any uh, questions? Well, um I think you probably don't, but uh, just to be sure, could somebody tell me uh, that you can still he uh, hear me? Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay, good. All right, so um, so then uh, that's it. We'll uh, I'll see you on Wednesday, but there's one issue that. Um, I need to talk to you. So uh, it seems um, that uh, the string, um, the string theory um, journal clubs will be um, will be restarted online, also together with ICTP at Trieste. Um, so Monday on, um, at ten, we'll not uh, be able to. I mean. Myself and other people might want to um, watch the, the uh, seminars, and um, also they will do. I think on Friday they will try try to do another um, seminar online. Um, and then I talked with uh, Nathan uh, and uh, Pedro, which I think are the people who uh, you probably. Um, uh, you're probably interested in uh, taking the courses from. Um, so um, we found that the only possibility really was, uh, well, I mean, except in, in the afternoon, but I don't, I prefer, uh, m very much prefer it in the morning, um, was for me to uh, teach Tuesday at 10. And at Thursday at nine, because at eleven starts Pedro's lecture. Um, so um, is that okay with everybody? So Tuesday, so uh, next week, starting next week, Tuesday at um, uh, ten and uh, Thursday at nine. Yeah, for me it's okay. Okay. For me, it's okay also, but just to make sure. So this week, we still have classes on Wednesday. On Wednesday, yeah. Okay. But starting next week, we'll start on, yeah. Great. Okay. Good. 
good. So I I uh, I think I will will leave it at, at like this. All right. So I'll see you on uh, Wednesday and then next week on Tuesday. All right. Um, bye.